Welcome. I'm Dr. Berkson, and I'm so excited to be having not just a redo, but a retake of the talk, The End of Estrogen Phobia. I'm going to share my screen now. Hi, everybody. So welcome, all you hormone owners. What we're going to cover today, and I've got to move all the faces are a little bit over the lettering, is we're going to talk about a message that needs to get out to everybody. I'm part of a coalition to try and save the compoundability of bioidentical hormones, and it's shocking how many gynecologists that we have on our committee that do not know this information. So it's an honor to come together to discuss what does hormone replacement, HRT, offer, why do we need it, and the controversy about it and surrounding it that should end now. That's why it's so delicious to have these gatherings together. I want to take a moment to thank my staff. There's a lot of people that help all of this happen. There's the amazing Karen and the amazing Sarah and the amazing Adam, who's become like a younger brother to me, and the amazing David and Lauren Kate, who is my goddaughter. There's lots to cover. We're going to have plenty of time for Q&A, Ask Away, and it's going to be toward the midtime, not during the lecture itself. We are going to put this on YouTube, so if you do not want your beautiful face shown on YouTube, please block your video now. You will be muted till we have the question time, and then we'll have you write the questions in the chat, and we'll see if we'll go verbal or not. So I just wanted to share a little bit about what I call the true vitamin C connection. These people here are my Mormon family that lived next door to me for 17 years and became like family. They moved away just about nine months ago, and they know that I go into anaphylactic shock if I'm stung by a wasp. So before they moved, Kent, who became like a rent -a husband to me, the doorbell rang. He showed up at the doorbell with three cans of wasp spray wasp spray in his arms. Now I've used one of them. So there's only two to take a picture of. And he said, nothing says I love you like three cans of wasp spray. So what you're going to learn in this little talk, and it's short, so we're just touching in on this, is nothing says I physiologically love you as much as getting your, ba your hormones balanced and making sure that they watch your physiologic back. You're going to learn that information for women, even though it's science-based, yo-yos for women, it's often biased, hidden, confusing, controversial, while often women, you, miss out. 2020 should be the year of estrogen vindication. I'm lecturing all around the country on it. Many of these lectures in 2020 were canceled, but rescheduled for 2021 because a lot of the pharmacists and physicians want to know the new science because the word has not gotten out yet. And that's what we're talking about today is to understand that. So estrogen's growing job description is vast. There's about 400 known at this time physiologic actions that estrogen does inside the body. It's not just about sexuality or reproduction. Did you know that estrogen replacement can actually make you have more of a scarlet O'Hara waist? Why would it do that? Because estrogen improves insulin resistance. So wouldn't you like to know how you can have better insulin resistance and a thinner weight without having to give up sugar 100% and be so phobic about it? Not that you should be eating a lot of sugar, but it's nice not to have to try and be a perfect person just to be comfy inside your bodysuit. It's extraordinary how much cardio protection there is, especially without medication, because usually as you start getting older, you enter the conveyor, conveyor, conveyor belt of pharmaceutical interventions, and often women on hormones don't have to go on the same meds at the same time, but morbidity of life is pushed further into the future. You can prevent things like old lady voice, look younger, longer, have more energy, and not just from Red Bull, and you can get the best bang out of your workout because it turns out that estrogen is the middle woman in epigenetics. So a lot of times when people are older, they say, you know, I go to the gym every day, but my muscles are sagging. I am eating better, but I'm not losing weight and I'm not having energy. 
your good choices have to make epigenetic changes in your gene expression. But if not enough estrogen is on board, you don't get the better bang for your better improving life choices. So estrogen has this huge job description, but aging is a time with less estrogen. That's why estrogen replacement is so important to ponder. It's efficaciousness, it's safety, and that's what we're going to touch on today. First off, why is any of this so important? The biggest reason is that America is a country that is aging. The first baby boomers reached 65 or Medicare in 2011. We now have 14% of the people in America that are 65 years or older, that translates into 45 million. And it's projected that a quarter, one out of four Americans by 2060 will be over 65 years of age. That projection says there'll be approximately 100 million Americans that are over 65. At the same time, our younger people, which we think is partly due to fertility issues from endocrine disruption issues and having births later on in life, and also because um, more people are overweight and the ratio of hormones uh, when they get skewed can play a role in fertility. So America is aging. America is aging. This is a baby going at the speed of light to an old woman. So the second question becomes, how will you age? Everyone wants to live longer, but nobody wants to age. And the other really important thing is America as a country is aging. How do we not topple Medicare? That is the big deal. So life expectancy is reaching an all-time high of 85 years. Centenarians are one of the fastest growing aging demographics. So how is all this going to come together? Enter hormones. HRT stands for hormone replacement. ERT stands for estrogen replacement. There's a big debate whether synthetic hormones, which are patentable drugs that are FDA approved like Premarin or Prempro or Estrace, if they are different or safer or more consistent compared to hormones made by compounding pharmacists, that's called compoundable BHRT, um, bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. So we refer to bioidentical hormones as CBHRT. The C stands for compoundable because your doctor sends in a script to compounding therapists. For many years, hormones were given for decades for about up to 20 million women. Some studies say up to 40 million, some studies say 18 million, but we know before the beginning of 2002, Many women were given hormones all around the world. It wasn't just in the United States. For decades, gynecologists, family practice docs, internists, they were comfy with giving women hormone prescriptions because they saw clinically in their practice that it made women live younger, longer, and it the promise was to be feminine forever or to... Um, Increase the time that you feel really good inside your body and looking at yourself in the mirror. Everything changed in July of 2002. So because America is an aging country and the NIH and the CDC were all aware of this, they decided to do a series of multiple studies at 40 different centers. This is called a multi-centered study. So they started to look at women every which way. How do their bones, um, how do their bone health unfold as they age? What is sitting? How does sitting impact them? How do cholesterol levels impact them? What's going on with dementia? What drugs have impact? How does vitamin D levels have an impact on colorectal cancer and bone health? They just put women under the microscope and looked at them every which way to try and figure out how not to topple Medicare. That's what we're all concerned about. And because that women had been given hormone replacement therapy for so many decades, they thought, let's do two randomized trials of giving women hormones. And we're going to prove once and for all in randomized con placebo controlled trials that hormones are efficacious. Everyone was sure that these two trials, one giving women estrogen and the other one giving women estrogen and synthetic progestins, that it, they were going to come out successful and women were going to continue being given hormones. But it was stopped prematurely, the two randomized arms, one with horse's estrogen, so it's called conjugated equine as a horse, so it's conjugated equine estrogen from a horse, that's what Premarin is, and the other one was a progester, a progestin, medroxyprogesterone acetate, <clears throat> so there were two different groups, one women got estrogen, 
And one woman got estrogen along with progesterone and they followed these women over time. They were gonna follow them for about eight years and about four and a half years, they stopped the study early because they said, oh, uh oh, it looks like the very things that we recommended hormones for are causing worsening of these problems in women. There's a higher incidence of breast cancer. There's a higher incidence of clots and strokes. And so the Women's Health Initiative, and that's when you hear the WHI, it stands for the Women's Health Initiative. It was stopped prematurely. Scary headlines sell. 2002, we have not been able to get those scary headlines out of the consciousness of women. If you hear the word estrogen, they cross their hands over their breasts and they have huge concerns that it's going to increase their risk of breast cancer. Doctors realized that Wyeth was successfully sued for billions of dollars of women who'd been on hormone replacement and then got breast cancer. And the amount of money paid out rang, made the air so sticky with litigious fear that that still has not left the paradigm and the consciousness today. In Europe, none of this happened. Most of the doctors in Europe prescribe estradiol or they prescribe the forgotten estrogen, the anti-cancer estrogen, estriol. So they didn't listen to the Women's Health Initiative. Also, many of the countries in Europe, like Finland and Sweden, the socialized countries, um, I'm hearing somebody's, I don't know if we've muted everybody. Can you please make sure everyone's quiet there? In socialized countries, often women are given hormones for free when they become menopausal. And then because they have registers, uh, they have a registry for breast cancer, a registry for cardiovascular disease, et cetera. And they can track the health of women who take the hormones and who keep refilling their scripts, they've been able to show that these women have less heart disease, less cancer, better health, and they're not toppling their socialized medicine. So the same things did not happen in Europe as it happened here, but we've never been able to get rid of in the American consciousness that scary headlines sell, even though the reanalyses of the statistics of the Women Health Initiative have not proven to be what the first scary headlines said they were. Within months, for example, Fred Naftalin is a statistician from Yale. He started publishing three or four months after July 2002 reanalyses of the statistics and he said, this is all wrong. This is all wrong. This is not what it says. Uh, many prestigious statisticians came out and said that. Leon Spiroff is considered the father of gynecology. He's written the book on gynecology and fertility that all people that go do a board certification in gynecology read. He started pumping out paper after paper. He must have 13, 14 papers saying, do not listen to the Women's Health Initiative. These randomized trials that were very short don't disprove decades of clinical efficacy that we saw when women walked in our door and walked out with a prescription. So he started, he put one article um, out in 2003, one article out in 2004, another article out in 2005, and all of them were saying, don't let the Women's Health Initiative stop you putting your pen on that prescription pad. It doesn't look like these randomized trials were efficacious. But the scary headlines have never left the consciousness of the American public, the fear of doctors of being successfully sued or losing their license, and women are thinking that they should age gracefully without hormones. Why not? If nature intended us to have hormones, we, they would remain on board and we wouldn't have menopause in our 50s, even though we might live to be in our 80s. Dr. Spiroff, he was really saying, please don't stop writing scripts. He reminded us that many studies, this is an article he wrote in 2004, a year and a half after the Women's Health Initiative first was stopped prematurely and first wrote the first articles about why. He said, many studies indicate that women who develop breast cancer while using postmenopausal hormone therapy have a reduced risk of dying from breast cancer. This is consistent with an effect on pre-existing tumors. We mostly think if you get cancer, if you initiate hormones, it's because you had a tumor that was growing silently beforehand because most tumors take nine or 10 years to develop. He said, please, it's pr breast protective. No one was listening to him, the father of gynecology. Women still are fearful of estrogen. There was also evidence starting to come up that if you used hormones transdermally versus swallowing them, you had much less issue with heart damaging downstream effects. And 
even can, uh, suggesting that you can take topical hormone replacement, even if you have genetic coagulation factors like factor five Leiden. So you're born with blood that's prone a little bit more to clumping. Usually you're now told standard of care, you're never a candidate for hormones, but the literature that compares putting the hormones on your skin or putting it on your mucosal in your vagina compared to taking it orally does not hold out. It looks like a big class of women who have genetic markers for procoagulation issues can still safely take hormones, but none of this is getting into mainstream literature and women are told that they're not candidates. So I watched all this happening and I've been on hormones myself for 22 years now, starting them a few years after I had breast cancer 26 years ago, because I was reading the data. And I was reading the data that showed that women on hormones who do get breast cancer tend to die less from it. And if you have breast cancer, you tend to have less recurrence from it. So I decided to embark on a book. And it took me three years to put all of this data together to really show and shake the shoulders of the cultural fear that estrogen and hormone replacement is a safer way to age than not. So my life's work has been that knowledge is power. And I wrote one of the first books on endocrine disruption called Hormone Deception. I've written a book on environmental castration and the role of hormones on your brain. You want a sexy brain because sex steroid hormones run your brain. That's why we have more cognitive decline as we age. Hor uh, sex steroid hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone ha have a tremendous positive influence on brain volume and brain function. And as we have less hormones, we have more shrinkage of brain and less signals in the brain. You really want a sexy brain or a brain that is signaled by sex steroid hormones. And based on my book, Hormone Deception, I was invited to be a hormone scholar at Tulane at an estrogen environmental think tank and um, make sure that I'm, can you, Okay, can you all hear me now? I think I pressed a button. I wanna make sure everyone can hear me. Can you hear me? Let me check the chat room here, just checking this. I can't seem to get into the chat room. Whoops, whoops. Let me go back here. Whoops. Okay, so I don't know what happened there, but. Um, I worked with the scientists who discovered the first estrogen receptor, the second estrogen receptor, and I have a huge academic and research background on hormones, and it's made me understand the power of how they can keep us younger longer, and they don't have that same fear factor, and I'm going to show you and bring you up to date how this is true, and I'm not the only one screaming this from the cloud. So there was a dark cloud over estrogen for the past two decades. Absolutely no doubt about that. But the sun is now emerging after the estrogen darkness. When did this really hit the sunlight? It was December, just six, seven months ago. Every year in San Antonio, there's a breast cancer symposium where breast cancer researchers from all across the United States and some from out of the United States come together to share their information. This December 19th was really pivotal. What happened was 13 prestigious cancer centers led by Dr. Rowan Schabowski presented remarkable new data on menopausal hormone therapy. They did an almost 20 year reanalysis of the Women's Health Initiative. And they said, let's take a look at this. We're now with 20 year vision, 20 year hindsight, looking at the fateful study that made most women fearful of estrogen, most gynecologists fearful of estrogen, let's look at it now with better statistics in 20 years under our belt. And what they discovered was that after 19 to 20 years, the conjugated equine estrogen, the Premarin, women who were um, given Premarin alone resulted in a significant 23% reduction in breast cancer incidence. So healthy women, that were given estrogen therapy had a significant, almost 25% reduction in getting breast cancer in the first place. But if women added the medroxyprogesterone acetate, the synthetic progestin, then there was a significant increase risk. Now we could have a whole entire talk about that because there's also a gentleman named Hudis who has um, put to question the whole methodology of the Women's Health Initiative, saying that maybe even the progestins are not nasty, but that's not, we don't have enough time really to go into that at this moment. 
Then they took a look at if you do get breast cancer and you're on um, hormones, what's your risk of dying from it? And women who were healthy women who went on estrogen and then ended up getting breast cancer had an almost 45% reduction in dying from it. Whereas it was a little bit the opposite if they had the combo treatment when the synthetic progestins were added. So the quote by Chabowski is, none of the approved agents for breast cancer risk reduction, you know, we're always looking, how do we reduce the risk of women getting breast cancer? No other agent, none, has been able to demonstrate a reduction in death breast cancer. So this is a very unique finding. And what they discovered is if a woman took hormones for a very short period of time, she got protection for a very long period of time. But they also suggested that if she did the combo with the conjugated equine estrogen, the Premarin, along with the synthetic progestin, she got um, a non-benefit and even a heightened risk for a long time. So Jabowski says a woman takes estrogen for five years and she's exposed to a 20-year breast protective benefit. Now, all women are worried that if they go on hormones, they're going to increase their risk of breast cancer. This is no longer the case. It's been put to its death, but people aren't hearing this. People are not hearing this. There's so much confusion in hormones. It's the hormone area of medicine is down a rabbit hole. And who misses out? You and me. We're the women that misses out. So um, this is the summary of the 19-year reanalysis. There's no more the old guy, but the new analysis says women who took estrogen only without the synthetic progestin, and there's a lot to show in the functional medicine world that natural progesterone does not in any way increase your risk. And I present in Safe Hormone Smart Women a lot of this analysis. I went back and reread my entire book when this 19-year analysis came out in December. I was thinking, did I get it right 10 years ago? And it was exactly on the money. So if you want to hear or read this in detail, you can read it there. But the 19-year reanalysis puts to rest the idea that estrogen drives breast cancer and that if you take estrogen therapy, you increase your risk of breast cancer. That is no longer true. Wipe, wipe, wipe. Like you go to a therapist to clear out your family of origin um, in Jewish, there's a word called mishigas, the stuff that still holds you back that you don't want to be held back by. Do not be held back by misinformation that is not even accurate. That's why we're having this little talk. So who was saying this besides, besides Dr. Shabowski at December 19th at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium? These are 13 prestigious breast cancer centers that all put their name on this reanalysis. This is not somebody with a pendulum saying, I, estrogen is good, and if it twirls this way, estrogen is bad. This is so set in science. The Los Angeles Biomedical Research Institute, the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, the Brigham and Women's Hospital that's associated with Harvard, Stanford Prevention Research Center, the University of Washington, the Pitt Public Health, the Kermas Cancer Institute, Stony Brook University, one of my very favorite places, a lot of my research buddies come from there, University of Tennessee Health Science Center, the Albert Einstein Cancer Center, the Ohio State University, and the UF Health internal medicine out of Gainesville, Florida. They all published this. They all put their names on this. They all said estrogen therapy in healthy women reduces significantly the risk of breast cancer. This is huge. So um, one of the uh, professors of medicine and uh, hematology and medical oncologist from uh, Mount Sinai said, it's clear that the risk, both positive and negative, continues beyond using hormone therapy. So if you took hormones for a short time at the time you began menopause, your breasts are protected for almost another two decades. So this should make headlines, right? Whippy, estrogen safe. Estrogen is breast friendly. Estrogen will protect your breasts for a really long period of time. Estrogen replacement in healthy women reduces the risk of getting breast cancer by almost 25%. And if you get breast cancer while you are on it, it reduces your risk of dying from it by almost 45%. There's nothing else that has statistics like this. So you would think this is the year that estrogen is vindicated. I put all this into an ebook, and this is like the cover of my ebook because this is so huge, but it didn't make huge headlines. I was invited to speak 
on HRT in Vegas in February to pharmacists that mostly write scripts for bioidentical hormones. And at that time, almost nobody knew about this information. Many doctors and gynecologists don't know about this information. So alas, that headlines never came up. This is what the headline came up. Um, the one article that was goes out to a lot of oncologists around the United States summarizing the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium and the 13 breast cancer centers having this consensus paper of the 19 year reanalysis of the Women's Health Initiative. What was the, the title of this? The title of this was breast cancer risk. I, I'm, I'm kind of hard to see this because it's blocked by something. Let me get back there, where'd it go? What happened to that? The breast cancer, oh, uh, I don't know why we're doing that, but we'll just go. So the breast cancer risk in that article was the one that was highlighted, totally highlighted. They said hormone replacement in combination increases the risk of breast cancer. That was the title of the article summarizing this paper. So the Associated Press coverage which we lost that slide, I don't know what happened to it, of the San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference headlined the 2002 findings of increased risk of breast cancer associated with when both hormones were put together, the synthetic progestin with the horse estrogen. And they mentioned the decreased risk associated with just taking estrogen in one sentence in small print way down in the body of the article where probably a lot of people aren't even gonna go. Once again, the good news isn't making it out there. Why are women so kept in the dark? Why are gynecologists so kept in the dark? If estrogen therapy is so breast protective, and now we know that it does so many other protective things on the body, like it rules epigenetics, why is there so much bias about the presentation of information? I was on a call on Friday with a number of um, pharmacists and gynecologists, and they were saying in Houston, all the gynecologists in Houston think that bioidentical hormones are a joke and that bioidentical progesterone doesn't oppose estrogen at the uterine lining. And there's a lot of data to show the opposite. So there's this huge darkness in women's health and you remain fearful of hormones and you age at an accelerated speed when you hit your city, 60s, like a speeding bullet, and you wonder why you're, you're getting wrinkled, you're getting more insulin resistant, you're gaining more weight. And what's the answer? More working out, more diets, get online with an online course, getting off sugar, when all the while, often hormone replacement could make a lot of your actions so much easier. And this is just at a time when we're learning so much more about the protective actions of estrogens and hormone balancing. So estrogen slows down heart disease. There's no doubt about it. There was um, a study that was run in Texas by a pharmacist where she took 66 women who were menopausal and tested their hormones and individually replaced them and then took another 66 menopausal women and let them just age gracefully. And she followed them for three years. The women who aged gracefully ended up on the conveyor belt of pharmaceuticals, drugs to help you sleep, drugs to lower your cholesterol, drugs to um, lower your blood pressure, weight gain issues, et cetera. The women on the hormone replacement, they were individualized for each woman, didn't have to go on the meds, had much better heart health, didn't have to go on sleep meds, had much better sleep, didn't have to go on blood pressure meds, had much better well-controlled blood pressure. And both groups of women stated they had lots and lots of stress. But the women on the bioidentical hormone replacement arm of that study all said they could handle the stress much better because hormones allow you to handle stress and they boost neurotransmitter synthesis so you feel better in your world living inside your bodysuit. So hormones slow down heart disease. They keep the inside of blood vessels flexible versus rigid. They reduce pro-inflammatory and pro-coagulatory molecules. They slow down weight gain, especially at the waist in most women, not all women. There's a very few number of women, especially if they don't get their hormones balanced, that can gain weight from hormones. So you have to work with a savvy practitioner. It protects mitochondria. We used to think mitochondria were the energy producing organelles and cells. Now we know they're like, they're like the 
ruler of the cells. They do many other actions, but you want your mitochondria alive and healthy and well. Turns out that estrogen protects mitochondria from damage. Um, estrogen reduces the risk of colorectal cancer, reduces the risk of risk of hip fractures. A woman ages, hip fractures become much, much more scary because often within a year to a year and a half after a hip fracture, you can um, have death. So if you reduce any of these things, you protect a woman more into her future. And again, as we mentioned before, the new exciting understanding of estrogen is that it's the middle woman of all of your positive choices of how you live. If you work out more and you're hormone, you're on replacement therapy, you get more muscles and you get less wrinkles and you get the benefit of those workouts. If you start eating better food, you get the benefit of that. So just as we're learning so much, those headline news should have made more headline news and they didn't. I wrote Safe Hormones, Smart Women, and early on in the book, I give Dr. Shelley Saul-Peter, who's a professor of medicine at Stanford, I give her a quote because it was so poignant to me. She reviewed 107 studies on the effects of hormone replacement therapy, and she found that menopausal women are much healthier when you're on hormones because it slows down aging and it does all the things we just discussed. So she has this quote, which I think is very, very powerful. Dr. Saul Peter says, and her name is kind of funny, but Dr. Saul Peter says, going off hormones has resulted in a time bomb waiting to explode. We now have large generation of women going into older years without protection. Hormone replacement therapy is your protection. It is not increasing your risk of breast cancer. She says, she goes on, we will start to see this damage in terms of heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, more frequent and prolonged hospitalizations, colon cancer, and bone fractures sometime in the future. Why? Because hormone replacement protects against all those things, protects against heart disease, against diabetes. It sens sensitizes your insulin receptor. It protects your kidneys. It helps your blood vessels be more flexible so you don't need high blood pressure medicine as often. It also helps you be, have a higher quality of life so you tend not to get as ill or get into the hospital. This is huge. So let's just take a look at some of the things that, that hormones do. I wrote my book, Sexy Brain, because sex steroid hormones rule the brain. So one of the biggest studies that has ever been done on preventing um, Alzheimer's disease, unfortunately came out three, four months after the 2002 July, when the false statistical fiasco of the Women's Health Initiative first publications that have now been proven wrong, wrong, wrong came out. So the first wrong um, papers of the WHI came out in July. In October of that year, the Cache County studies started to publish. This is they, uh, a group of researchers in Salt Lake uh, or in Utah, excuse me, in Cache County, Utah, and they took close to 10,000 people who were healthy in their 50s, and they followed them into the future, so it's a prospective study, to see who got dementia and who didn't, and what were the variables. And what they discovered is if you had been on estrogen for at least 10 years, you had a reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease, AD, by 50%. If Dr. Oz had a television show and said something reduced the risk of Alzheimer's disease by 50%, everyone would go out and get it. Hormones protect your brain. First, we worried about the big C, cancer. Now the other big C is cognitive decline. We even find that hormone replacement after brain damage, head injury, after stroke, helps reduce some of the adverse deleterious effects on the brain. So estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, oxytocin, they all help the brain function. They all help the brain maintain volume, just like women want to get filler and Botox because they want to have the volume of youth, the volume of your brain. When your brain and hippocampus have more youthful volume, your brain and cognition function better. This alone, now you put this together with hormones are breast protective as long as you don't add a synthetic progestin. This is huge. But yet right now there's only 5 million women in the United States on hormones. After the Women's Health Initiative, there, are, there were about 500,000 women on hormones. It went from multiple millions to a half a million, and now we're up to 5 million, half of who are on bioidentical hormones and half of who are on synthetic hormones. But we now have we're looking into the future of in 1960, having 100 million people that are going to be 65 and older 
and they're going to be having all these old age issues. If you had an anti-aging tool that slowed down aging and was safe, wouldn't you want to consider it? The brain, if you just look at the hippocampus, is this little tiny area of the brain where your memory lives, your sense of self lives, your motivation lives. I like to think this is kind of the physiologic analogy of your soul. This is where you live, and this is what shrinks and loses volume right before you get Alzheimer's disease. Well, they've now shown if they give women estrogen and men testosterone, they can revolumize the volume of the hippocampus and reverse frailty and cognitive decline. Hormones are caretakers of the brain, but the Cash County studies were published several months after the Women's Health Initiative, so they're hardly known, all that work. And about 50 studies have spun off all that research. An amazing body of research, hardly known. Didn't make hardly any headlines, but you and I are getting together right now. I'm sharing this now, you know, now you see the science in this. This isn't me just making this up. This is all based on science, but for some reason, it hasn't been able to shake the, the fear in the culture of doctors and patients that estrogen will cause breast cancer or heart disease. Now, there were many studies spun off the Women's Health Initiative. This one just came out in 2018. And again, it's by that wonderful dude, Rowan Jabowski. I like to follow his work because he's a really cool guy. And a lot of people, as they get older, have painful joints. And then you get on a lot of medications. A lot of these medications are damaging to your gut. And um, all, we could go on a whole talk on just that. But what they discovered, and they looked at 11, almost 11,000 women who had no uterus, so they just gave them estrogen, Premarin. They discovered that if women went on hormones, they had less joint pain and they often didn't need to go on meds. So hormones are breast protective, they're heart protective, they're joint protective. They often lower your need for meds or they push your need for meds further into your future so that you can have a younger middle years of your 60s and 70s and maybe even the beginning of your 80s and not be what you think is the inevitable frail person you were always taught that aging would make you become. But then the worry is, well, that all sounds good, heart health, joint health, brain health, but I'm worried about breast cancer. Well, now the reanalysis of the Women's Health Initiative, sponsored by those 13 prestigious cancer societies. And, you know, I published this in, in some blogs and I started getting letters from doctors going, yeah, I want to see the data. I don't believe this. There is so much solidification of fear and bias against these hormones. It's almost like the best of science can't blow it up and show you the facts. That's why we're having this little meeting so that you can then make your own decisions. But women and their doctors, their surgeons, their cancer doctors have not heard this news. I spoke in the Vegas conference in February. No one there had heard it. And all this information came out in December. No headlines about it. Most gynecologists don't know about this. Now we're on a coalition for maintaining our rights for compounding pharmacies to compound bioidentical hormones versus making only hormones allowed by FDA approved ones on the market. There is a big battle over the dollars for hormones because there's going to be almost 100 million people over the age of 65 by 2060 and hormones are going to become more and more widely accepted because they slow down aging and because they don't cause breast cancer. So who's going to have the money? Who's going to profit from all those sales? Because of that battle over the dollar, there's bias, bias, bias. Even among the doctors this last Friday, I could go in and chat with you. Maybe it'll come up in the questions of some comments made by those doctors that shocked the patooties out of me because they these are doctors who just got into functional medicine a year ago, two years ago, and they don't understand the power and safety of bioidentical hormones. So now I have to tell you one other thing, and we're almost getting ready for our questions. So when the Women's Health Initiative came out, Premarin and Prempro were the most widely selling pharmaceuticals, more than proton pump inhibitors, more than antidepressants, they were the number one drug sold. So when that Women's Health Initiative came out, their stocks tanked. So what did those old CEOs of Premarin and medroxyprogesterone acetate do? 
they decided to create their own bioidentical hormones and put them through phase one, two, and three trials to fulfill NIH requirements and start publishing data on it. So in 2015, they started publishing that they have a brand new uh, trial underway is going to be phase one, two, and three of looking at bioidentical estrogen and bioidentical progesterone, because we now know that, uh, and they call it replenish, that um, this is, it works. We're going to test it for a year, which they did. They looked at the endometrial lining in women who still had a uterus and it didn't grow out of control. And they saw that after a year, women taking bioidentical hormones was totally safe. And they published recently another update that says all of the re published data suggests a safer profile of estradiol and natural progesterone compared with conjugated equine estrogens and progestins. So the old CEOs that made Premarin and Prempro are now making bioidentical hormones. And they're about ready to launch. And their new product is called Replenish. And at the very same time, the FDA, who hired a, an academy, a scientific academy group, and paid for that group to evaluate the legal compoundability of bioidentical hormones by pharmacists, none of it based on science, is trying to make it illegal for compounding pharmacists to compound bioidentical hormones, which is about two thirds of their business. Why? Because the FDA approved bioidentical hormones are about to launch and it's all about the money and the women are sitting here and we don't know what's going on because our doctor tells us we don't need hormones. We're a high risk person. We shouldn't get hormones. It's so confusing. I so get it. I had breast cancer and I'm on hormones. You can best believe everyone told me to go off hormones. And now everyone says to me, how do you look and act the way you are being such an old, old person? So it's all about money and you shouldn't be missing out because of that. So the battle is on. We have more aging Americans. It's coming out in the literature that bioidentical is safer than not by the people who are promoting the companies. Hormones are efficacious. They protect your insulin receptor. They protect your brain, your waistline, your energy, your mitochondria, your epigenetics. But who's going to get the money for making it? Because believe me, they're coming down the pike. So where do you want to get these hormones? Do you want to get them from compounding pharmacists who've been compounding them for several decades and are really some of the best healers and smartest people in this arena that we have on the planet and have been keeping up in all of their CME courses, all of this data? I would want to do that. So I'm going to go through this now because I want to get to the questions, but scary headlines sell, positive ones don't. So your doctor hasn't heard about this. You haven't heard about this. A lot of compounding pharmacists haven't even heard about this. So I wanted you to hear about this. This is not reflected in standard of care. Women are often told you're not a candidate. Your mother had breast cancer. You're not a candidate. You're Dan as hell are a candidate. You'll be better protected if you're on estrogen than if you're not. That doctor is wrong. I can't tell you how often words coming out of experts' mouth are wrong, but how do you assess this? You get together in groups like this and go over the science because the science over a period of 20 years doesn't lie. I have 21 books out. Most of them are on hormones because I'm passionate about this. I did my first rotation in integrative medicine with Jonathan Wright in 1977, and he was is considered the father of bioidentical hormones. So I've been looking at hormones since 1977 testing them on my patients, had breast cancer, wrote all those books and have been on hormones myself. I've done the deep dive. Now I'm not the only person by any means, but there's not a lot of people who've put all the connect the dots together. So there's now 13 different studies of breast cancer patients from cancer institutions that were put on Premarin and followed from four and a half to seven and a half years. And the breast cancer patients on estrogen had less recurrence, less death if they did get recurrence, and they have an improvement in overall quality of life and less premature all-cause mortality. So they live longer from all kinds of issues. And you can read about that in depth by Estrogen Matters um, by Abram Blooming. We could go in a long discussion about him. He's a wonderful gentleman, oncologist in Southern California, but he works for Wyeth that makes Premarin. He only uses Premarin. There is a conflict of interest, so God bless him. Um, he let me interview him for Safe Hormones, Smart Women, but then when he saw that I talk about bioidentical hormones, he didn't let me interview him for the sequel that's coming down the pike. 
So estrogen is breast protective and you can read this on your own when you go over the slides at which this will all be put on YouTube. The talk on Monday will be put on YouTube, which is different from this talk. They were both different. I'm so passionate about this. I didn't wanna just do a replay. I wanted to do a redo and tweak it a bit and get more questions. And the one thing that we've discovered that's the big wow, I mean, the mind boggling wow, is that according to Avram and all of the literature, we used to think that bioidentical hormones are better and synthetic or horses estrogen, bad, bad, bad. We now discover that any hormone is better than none. Functional docs think bioidentical is better, although a lot of gynecologists do not know that, do not appreciate that. But even being on synthetic hormones is better than not being on any because they are so heart protective, brain protective, breast protective, bone protective, col colorectal protective, mitochondrial protective, epigenetic protective. They are watching your physiologic back. Nothing says I love you better than balanced hormones protecting your physiologic back. But the war is on, replenish is coming out. Hormones are the most powerful anti-aging tools, more than exercise, more than food. They are more foundational than any of those, but of course they should be combined with exercise and food. But you eat great food so that your hormones, not just the level that you test it, um, that you assess in a test, but can signal at the receptor because receptors require multiple nutrients to allow hormones to really work. But there's huge competition for the money. Do not miss out because of someone else wanting to profit off of you versus help you. And that's why we have these kind of talks. So I've been a breast cancer survivor for 26 years. I've been in practice almost 50 years. Do the math. I'm not saying my age. I still lie on the dating platforms. But anyway, if you like my stuff, I hope you like my stuff. I want to come together in a group that doesn't have yelling, doesn't have bullying, but really wants to go into the data and share it with a positive, entertaining, full of life experience. So it's, not, it's a place... There are not a lot of places available in my mind to get science, savviness, and fun all put together. So I put together a membership called Smart Plus Heart. So I'm announcing my new membership. I've been thinking about this for a long time. I have commitment issues, so it took me a long time to commit to this. <laughs> but it's called Smart Plus Heart, and there's three levels. And the first, um, and one of the reasons I'm doing this is also because Facebook's new algorithms are very difficult to see my posts. So I work for two hours every morning. I sleuth with my cup of joe, which is the most dependable man in my life. I sleuth the science and make these fabulous posts. And I, with Facebook's new algorithms, sometimes only 40 or 50 people can see them. So that's not working for me. So I want a private Facebook group. And I've been making these posts for free for nine and a half years. Now I need to have a little bit of support to pay my staff. I've got Karen and Sarah and David and Alan, uh, and um, Adam and LK, and I'm looking to create a membership that will allow me to continue to do my podcasts, my blogs, and my posts so I can continue to, to serve. The first 150 people that sign up, and we're almost there, we only have about 40 spaces left, will be put into a lottery to get a free intake with me. So there's fun if you sign up sooner than later, but we're announcing the memberships. The first 150 people have a chance to win a free consult with me, which is a $750 value. And I spend overall about five hours of a deep dive focused mainly on you. There's three different levels. You can just do the Facebook group, or you can meet with me once a month, just like I'm doing now. I'll go over some data. We'll talk about it. We'll have time for Q&A. And then there's another level of professionals where we go over case studies and we do a much deeper dive. And then I have mentorshiping, which you get discounts on, on this middle and second level. And at each level, you get to buy my courses on Thinktific. Um, I have a little university online. And by the end of next week or two, I'll have almost eight or nine courses up there. I think right now I have six or seven courses up there, and you'll get discounts on all of those if you want to participate and come play with me. So how you find out about this is my website, drlindsayberkson.com forward slash membership. Just go there and check it out. If this is, if you want to be smart plus heart and learn this data, because I'm telling you, there's so few places to go where you hear it right. And I'm just going to give you a little example because a question might come up. So 73 of us are trying to fight for our rights for compounding pharmacies 
to continue to be able to compound bioidentical hormones. And we now have all these smaller committees. So on Friday, and we're all doing this for no money, we're doing this to help maintain our rights. So on Friday, we had a meeting and this gynecologist that I've now mentioned twice said, well, everybody in Houston feels that bioidentical hormones are a joke and everyone knows there's an epidemic now of uterine cancer from women taking bioidentical hormones because um, natural progesterone doesn't oppose or protect the lining or, or the endometrium of the uterus. So I, I wrote in the little chat box to her, well, what about Helen Leonetti's studies um, that came out in, earlier where she showed she gave women progesterone and she monitored the, their endometrial stripe and they didn't have any proliferation. So she wrote back, those studies are too old and they weren't long enough. So what I did is I went back and looked, those first study was published in 2004, the second study in 2005. She and I were friends when she was coming out with this research. And she followed the women for a year and she followed their endometrial stripes. Well, Replenish, which is now about to launch, I went back and looked at their data. It turned out that the NIH has accepted them as safe because they followed the women for a year and they looked at their endometrial stripes. So they have replicated what Helen Leonetti did. So it's not true that progesterone intervention uh, doesn't oppose estrogen at the lining of the uterus. And none of my colleagues or pharmacists have seen an increased epidemic of uterine cancer from women on bioidentical hormones. But if you go to that physician in Houston, she will tell you that. And you will be sitting there thinking, oh my God, that's dangerous and I don't know what to do. The bad, scary headlines that aren't even accurate might disallow you one of the best benefits of your life. So that's why I'm doing this kind of thing. I've been in the literature for almost 50 years. I love to put everything together. It's not that I know everything. No one is the end all be all. I hate arrogant people who think they know it all, but I do have a lot under my belt and I don't know how much longer I have on this little planet earth. And I want to make this all available for you. So let's um, stay up to date and play with us. And I'm going to now open up to questions. I'm going to unshare if I can do this because I've had can't really see the bottom of my screen to unshare. There we are, stop sharing. Do it right here. And I'm gonna to go to some questions. And um, it's, uh, I see the time right now. Okay, so I'm gonna start the questions right now. I had breast cancer twice, was told it was estrogen related once. Last time was, and now I'm 66 and not happy with my memory decline, climbing blood pressure, wondering how I could start hormone treatment. When I live in a small town in Kentucky, who could I see? Who could I see who could help with this? So you're gonna to have to work with someone that understands the work of Avram Blooming. He summarizes all of this in his book and I summarize this in an ebook on my website called Estrogen Vindication. I wrote that for you to hand to your doctors. So you should get a doctor or a nurse practitioner or a PA who could work with you. So the best thing to do is call your compounding pharmacists in your area. Often they're some of the smartest, best healers that we have and ask them who in your area works with hormones and knows the literature about giving hormones to some breast cancer patients um, it, that are survivors. There is a lot of peer review data, for example, on testosterone. If you can't find any doctor comfortable with estrogen, which is what Avram Blooming did the longest study ever. He's a cancer doc in Southern California and he published his data on breast cancer patients and estrogen using Premarin, and they all had decreased in incidence of recurrence, decreased death if they got it back, et cetera. I've said all that stuff. So the best thing to do is go to your compounding pharmacist. They're wonderful, walk in the door, introduce yourself, tell your story and ask who they know in your area that might be helpful to work with. But there are not even a lot of functional doctors that know that science with high risk women. But if you join my group, we can chat about that more. Okay, um, would you please give a functional Wait, they're, they're moving. No, anyone, how do you address water weight gain? Well, that could be multifactorial. You know, you can have water weight gain if you eat a lot of foods that you don't digest well because your microbiome or digestion is off. Um, maybe scroll up to the top. Okay, so let me do that. I'm gonna scroll up to the top here. Let's go to this. Um, so weight gain can be many, many, many reasons. So usually it's but it can also be heart disease. So you always have to rule out organic disease and then look for other possible problems underneath that. So that's actually a simple question, 
but a complicated question. So if you don't have heart disease, I would look at your digestion and food reactivities because your body will hold on to water if you consume food and don't handle it well. Um, my, gyne my gynecologist tells me to take out my ovaries, says they won't produce hormones anymore. Well, I don't know your story about why someone is recommended to take out ovaries, but ovaries are like a metronome with your health. And even though you're older and they might not be producing lots of estrogen, they still um, have a variety of things that they do with your circadian rhythm in connection to light and dark in the planet. So I can't really answer that because that's such a wild question out of left field, but um, probably that would be something I'd need to know more of your story to really go in depth to serve you well, which is what I would want to do is serve you well. Um, had a question for you. I have a patient who is 50 years old, so this must be a doc or something, and is perimenopause. She does not know where she is in her cycle. If she starts biased and progesterone cream, what is the best way for her to start that? Start biased in the AM and progesterone at night, blah, blah, blah. I have biased six days. Okay. So the deal is, Perimenopause is when you're not in menopause yet, and it can be anywhere up to 10 years. And now we're even seeing women, some women in their 20s go into perimenopause because we have a toxic planet and toxic food and our hormones aren't functioning in the way that they used to. So we're seeing milestones of reproduction change and we're seeing perimenopause, which is normally the 10 year period before postmenopause, get earlier and earlier. When she says she doesn't know where she is in her period, it sounds like she's very erratic in her bleeding. If someone is very erratic in their bleeding, what we do is we just have them start with day one of the month and use that. And the reason that you cycle hormones when you're perimenopausal is that a premenopausal woman cycles their hormones. And the more close you mimic mother nature, the less trouble you get in. The length of the cycle and how we cycle depends a lot on how the person feels. Sometimes, for example, if a young, young girl has severe migraines that estrogen helps, and it, when she goes off the estrogen, her migraines come back, we might even still have her be on hormones even while she's menstruating. So there's no in black and white to-dos and not to-dos. It varies incredibly. Harvard just presented at a conference about a year ago, giving 24 girls from age 14 to 24 estrogen patches for anxiety, for body dysphoria, for all kinds of things. And they left these young girls on estrogen for a long period of time and they all felt a lot better. They didn't even wanna go off the estrogen. Harvard, pediatricians giving estrogen to teenage girls. So the whole landscape of hormones is changing. It's not just that hormones are about perimenopause and menopause, and we've mostly spoken about that in this little tiny talk. But then that means that if we cycle hormones, it's not going to be the really the same way for every single patient. And it depends on their age, what their issues are, et cetera. So that's kind of an involved question. The woman, this woman has endometriosis and fibroids, an unknown history of breast cancer. What's an unknown history? Uh, you don't know if she had breast cancer and she hasn't had any kids. This sounds like if you want to join my professional group, we would do a deep dive on this in my professional group. This sounds like a deep dive question because there's just not enough info on that patient for me to answer it. But um, when a woman is premenopausal and perimenopausal, we usually try to cycle the hormones because there's a lot of data that cycled hormones are safer. Uh, in my book, Safe Hormones, Smart Women, I have a whole chapter on breast cancer patients and hormone replacement. And the breast cancer patients who took their hormones cycled had less recurrence of any kind of cancer than the ones that didn't take it cycled. So cycling tends to be protective, but there's a spectrum of cycling. And I'd need to know a little bit more. I hope that answer was helpful. And I hope you don't think I'm just getting out of answering you. I cannot attend the whole session. Yes, we will have, we will put this session up on YouTube, the last Monday night session, which is a little bit different up on YouTube. We will also have this up on Facebook Live. So there'll be all kinds of portals for you to gain entry. <clears throat> thank you so much for hosting this. I think you are great. Oh, thank you. I'm wondering if I can watch this later. Everyone can watch this later. I went to my gynecologist and she acted like I was going to grow a beard, break a bone and stroke out. See because I'm on estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. When I questioned her, she quoted studies and I left feeling confused. 
so much of what's out there is bullshit. Bullshit, I hate to swear, but it's so much bullshit, I can't stand it anymore. I can't stand the arrogance and I can't stand the misinformation. That's why I'm doing this membership. <laughs> Plus I wanna help pay my staff because I've been working hard with my own patients and then paying the thousands of dollars a month to be able to have the free podcasts and the, the blogs, et cetera. But so much of what is out there is so wrong, but then how do you get to the right, right? And there is right out there. There are good practitioners out there, but I always say the best way is to go to your local compounding pharmacist. And there's, there are probably some compounding pharmacists that aren't great. There's always somebody not great. There's probably some not great garbage collectors and some great one. So you want to find some really great compounding pharmacists, go in and get the feel for it. Ask around for your friends that are on bioidentical hormones where they go. And they often have the lifeline of the docs who, are, who has the best bedside manner, who specializes in this, who doesn't, because they're fulfilling those scripts. So make friends with your compounding pharmacists. If, um, I love them and I respect them. And I think they're a phenomenal um, industry and profession. And the big pharma is trying to shut them down. It's just a battle for the dollar and you miss out. And most of the gynecologists are misinformed. They basically do procedures, hand out birth control pills and give you estrogen patches. And I don't mean to put them down either, but I've, I've been the patient across the desk from so many doctors when so many of those opinions have been wrong, 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 and bullshit. And so I've had to do a deep dive to figure out how to claw my health so that now in my later years, and I am in my later years, I have the youth I never had when I was younger. I now have that when I'm older. And I realize you have to find allies. You have to find who you think is honest, who's making sense to you and surround yourself with that and not get frustrated because it's probably the way medicine has always been. No one person has all the answers and everyone's burned out and there's a lot of chaos in the world right now. So people are even more burned down than not. But remember, hormones have been out of the consciousness of physicians for almost 20 years. Wyeth was successfully sued for billions and everyone was said that hormones cause breast cancer and heart disease. So this is why we're discussing this because, okay, we're gonna have, I'm gonna keep going. Um, uh, if you have a hormonal problem, stemming from hypothalamus or pituitary, should you fix that and not just give estrogen? Well, you know, there is a hormone crosstalk between your brain and your hormones. And sometimes there's so many, hormones are a tapestry. They're not just going and getting your blood levels or your saliva levels or your urine levels tapped. That's just a level. Then they have to be able to communicate with your brain. Then they have to swim on into a series of proteins in the shape of a satellite dish and dock. To do that, the satellite dish has to be available and not filled with toxins. Or there has to be iodine, B6, magnesium, zinc, um, a multitude of nutrients that you've digested well from healthy food choices. It's this bigger picture and all hormones are a family. They function and dysfunction together. So if you have a low testosterone and someone just gave you testosterone therapy, but you're not feeling anything from it, it might very well be that your insulin isn't working well, or your mineral corticoids aren't working well from your adrenal glands. All the hormones influence each other. So a savvy doctor looks at all your hormones to help you with your hormones. So is HRT safe for those of us with hormone positive breast cancer? Well, every woman is different, but yes, 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 yes. So I was ER positive 99 and PR positive 100. And the, what that says really isn't that that cell is fed by those hormones. It means all, all cells in your breast have estrogen receptors, progesterone receptors, HER2 new receptors, oxytocin receptors, prolactin receptors. Your breast is flush with these satellite dishes that take signals from hormones. That's what a receptor is. So if you have estrogen progesterone receptors, your cell still has some remnants of normal cells so that you have less abnormal cells. And when you get into a, a triple negative breast cancer, it's a different animal because it's more a, a cell that's more damaged and altered than the ER positive, PR positive. We're no longer thinking that estrogen drives most breast cancer, but you'd, you really should read my ebook, Estrogen Vindication, that explains this. 
and Avram Blooming's book. Avram Blooming was the, um, before Avram Blooming, when a woman got a diagnosis of breast cancer, you'd have this disabling dis distortion, these surgeries that remove most of your upper body and women were terrified to be so mutilated. And he was the oncologist that proved that conservative interventions were as effective as these old time severe interventions. And he's been in practice over 50 years and he's leading the pack of saying it's safe for women with breast cancer even if you're ERP or positive, that's even better to be on hormones, but it's all individual. You can't just make a sweeping statement, but there's now 13 studies on women with breast cancer who've been given hormones and they've been matched to groups who have not been given hormones and they fared better. So the old adage where if you had breast cancer, you should never be on hormones. That's not true anymore, but that's still the standard of care. So that's why meeting and coming together like this is important because grassroots helps nudge standard of care. Um, for those of you who cannot stay on the entire webinar today, you can watch the webinar on Facebook Live because we've kind of gone long, but I want to go through the questions. So don't forget that you can watch it on Facebook Live and it will ultimately be put up on YouTube also. I have your book, Sexy Brain, and the pharmacy you listed cannot ship where I live. Well, that's, yeah, so that, so. Ever since I published that book, the FDA now made it illegal for compounding pharmacies to ship to states they don't have licenses in, and most compounding pharmacies can't maintain licenses in all states. So it's all changed since I published that book because they're constantly trying to minimize the capabilities and scope of practice of compounding pharmacists. So if you want to get oxytocin, you have to work with um, a practitioner that understands it. I've got a new book coming out on it um, sometime in 2021. But you have to work with a compounding pharmacy that also knows how to fulfill oxytocin scripts, and that's a whole nother world. I live in Texas where Jim Hinsier runs Las Colinas Pharmacy outside of Dallas, and he's like brilliant, 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 and we get to have almost anything we want because he's so brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So you got to find brilliant people that you can depend on, but that's why the FDA changed all of that. Um, from Dr. Berry to everyone, yes, what is that? I don't know what that is. Um, Okay, you could hear me. Okay. I would love to share the YouTube of this talk with my naturopath. Go ahead, share away. Yes, please. Do you know what I don't understand why there's so much arrogance in medicine? And the minute that we know something, they want to own that space. So if the American Diet had a, uh, the American Heart Association last week came out with a landmark study saying cardiac patients should have a nutritional evaluation when they go in to see a heart doc, which is great. But you know, chiropractors, nutritionists, naturopaths have been saying this for decades. But now I bet you they're going to want only MDs or dietitians to own that space. Some governor just made CrossFit trainers able to talk about nutrition. I worked with a kidney doctor who invented telemedicine and signed the bill in with Bush. Telemedicine in the pandemic has been amazing. And a lot of us run distant practices now with telemedicine. I bet you people are going to want to start owning that space. So I'm all for keeping as much rights as we can, as less government intervention as we can, and as much grounded science and sound science as we can. That's why I'm opening up my membership. Um, what about estrogen injections using, using Della est estrogen, for example, and does it increase? I would not give estrogen injections. Uh, you know, I worked in Tulsa and in Tulsa, the doctor I worked with did pellets and he did estrogen and testosterone injections. And a lot of women loved it, but you get a real high blood super physiologic level, and then it kind of goes down. But if you have any kind of genetic coagulatory condition, it is definitely clot promoting and it's intense. So I don't know why you would do that when you have so many other delivery routes available to you, but he did it. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to skin a cat and a lot of ways to take in hormones. And it's always good to know every single way and the pros and cons of each of them. And that's what we'll get into in my professional level of the membership. There are some people who love injections. Oh, it's Diane. Well, if they love injections, then that's a good way to go. It's just important to know that there's the high and the low and Often with pellets and injections, you want to give people's receptors a break. So at the Wiseman Family Practice Clinic, where I worked for six, seven years, now they do a lot of pellets. And Selma and I are best friends. She runs Heads It now. She's a nurse practitioner. And she has worked out that when people go off the pellets, she gives them a two-week break to give the receptors a break. Because when you go real high like that, you turn off the receptors. 
So hormones aren't like carcinogens where the dose is the poison and the more exposure, the worse the issue. Hormones are the opposite. Low levels and high levels turn off the receptor. And you want to get that mid amount of hormone to optimize the signaling of that receptor. So when you do a delivery like a pellet or a shot that has moments of super physiologic dosages, those receptors are tamped down a bit. They're not turned up a bit. They're actually tamped down a bit. So often if you give periods when you use those interventions of cycling off, it lets the receptor breathe a bit. So Pam Smith calls it giving the receptor a receptor holiday. Um, my doc just said he wants to remove ovaries because of cysts. I want to remove cysts and keep ovaries. He says ovaries do not produce any hormones after menopause. There's a big, there's some debate on that, that uh, ovaries do produce some hormones. Um, but there are lots of ways to say, why are you forming the cysts? What's the root cause? Are you progesterone insufficient? In my book, Natural Answers for Women's Health that Rodale published, I have a whole chapter on cysts and a herbal formula that I came up with in the 80s that helps get rid of recurrent cysts in a lot of women, along with balancing the hormones, especially testosterone and progesterone, which are opposing hormones to estrogen. So you want to go more to the root cause. I would, and maybe, you know, most doctors don't have time to go to root cause in a regular practice. It'd be so great if functional docs and regular docs could work together because we all do so many complementary things, but we got to get out of all that arrogant, I own the space, you shouldn't own this space, and this is how it is. And I'm so tired of that energetic. What is the Jewish word for love? Gefell, gefell. My heart is gefelling that we're all connecting. That was a lovely question. Elizabeth Greer, thank you for that question, Elizabeth. Very sweet. I think I'm a mutt, spiritual mutt, because I love everybody. Okay, questions from Facebook Live. How do you tackle the problem of being estrogen deficient, but also estrogen dominant? This whole estrogen dominant thing makes me really mad because there's a good estrogen dominance and it makes estrogen sound bad. All you're talking about with estrogen dominance is that they're out of balance. That's all you're talking about. And you want to get the person back in balance. And many hormones help estrogen work more in balance. Oxytocin is the best friend of estrogen. Thyroid is the best friend of estrogen. It's not just progesterone and testosterone. So I can't say it enough that all the hormones are a family that function and dysfunction together. Um, someone's giving me something privately, so I don't know if I should answer that. So I have some private things. I'm not going to answer that, answer them out loud. Um, do you recommend stopping estrogen replacement therapy if diagnosed with breast cancer? Well, that's an individual question. You'd have to talk with the person and exactly what's going on, but no, not necessarily so. But I would really take a look at testosterone. Um, if you read my book, my ebook on my website, designed just for this, where you could read the science of testosterone therapy and aromatase inhibitors, which you can do natural or pharmaceutical, and hand this to your doctor. It's written with all the citations. The very first hormone that's the safest with the least debate is testosterone because it's very anti-proliferative at the breast. So there's lots of questions. And these are that question is so I'd have to know a lot more contextual information to serve the answer of that question better. Here's another private one, so I don't feel like I should answer it. Don't forget, if you want to join my membership, because we only have a few more spaces and you get in a lottery to win five hours of my time focused on you, go to drlindsayberkson.com forward slash membership. If you want to get the estrogen vindication book, you go to drlindsayberkson.com forward slash product forward slash estrogen dash vindicated dash ebook, et cetera. Maria B., what explains the existence of ER positive breast cancer? Well, I just said all breast cells have estrogen receptors. So that cell still has some normalcy. So it's still maintaining some of the estrogen receptors. Yet oncologists persist in treating ER breast cancer by using drugs to reduce estrogen levels. That is a great question, Maria B. Absolutely great question. I address this a bit in my estrogen vindication book, but you're exactly right. And that has been the bugaboo because none of the science really, well, I won't say none of the science, a significant amount of science does not really support reducing estrogen. Now, tamoxifen is an estrogen blocking agent, but actually 
over 60 to 70% of women who go on it end up getting their estrogen five to fourfold, uh, five to sixfold elevated within so many years. It actually boosts estrogen levels and it works as an anti-carcinogen on multiple mechanisms. But in the habit study, the only women who didn't benefit from estrogen replacement by having less risk of recurrence were ER positive breast cancer patients taking tamoxifen because they couldn't benefit from the estrogen, which we now know is beneficial. So we are in this volcano of this new bulk of information saying hormones are breast protective with this old corpus or body of information saying the opposite and they're meeting in the middle like a brick wall. Poof, and that's why it's important to be armed with information and understand the bigger picture. Uh, the difference between good estrogens and bad estrogen ratio, well, they're really, it's not like they're totally good or totally bad. It's really the amount. And you look at the parent estrogens and you look at the catechol estrogens or the hydroxylated estrogens. But there's a lot of debate about that, whether that they hold that good to bad totally holds up. Some people still believe in it and some people don't. Um, so there is a softness about that data. It's not hard data. Uh, was non-compliant with progesterone and had some bleeding doctor ordered an ultrasound. I don't know what that is. That's the woman who asked for the word of love. Bad recycled. Well, yeah, you know, so so someone wrote bad recycled estrogens cause cancer. Well, the, the four hydroxyl catechol estrogens are very DNA damaging. And that's what we think. If you don't properly metabolize your estrogens, it puts you more at a higher risk, but it's not the parent estrogen. It's the metabolism of the estrogen. And there are things to do to gently nudge the estrogen to go down a safer, more protective pathway. The real question is how to find a doc who does know all this. That is true. And that's why I'm trying to train a lot of docs before I, I go to my next incarnation. Do you suggest, and not that I'm the end all be all, but it's putting, this is a lot of important information that needs to get passed on. Do you suggest synthetic hormone is as good as bioidentical? I don't suggest it's as good, but it's better than none. Stress reduction is a key to reducing risk of breast cancer. Cortical st cortisol stress hormone decimates your immune system. Um, it's very good to get a handle on stress. That's really true. It's definitely a powerful factor. It's not the only factor, but once you get a diagnosis of breast cancer, everybody's cortisol levels are sky high because you're scared to death. Um, so it's very important to know how to mitigate the downstream potential adverse effects of cortisol. An elevated cortisol can sit on anyone else's receptor and make other hormone signals hard, but it's not the only issue. I wouldn't say stress. Um, stress reduction is the key to reducing risk of breast cancer. I don't agree with that. I think stress is important, but do I think stress reduction is as as important as having balanced hormones or optimal digestion or great exercise. I don't know if I'd ever say one thing and maybe in one person it isn't because they have so much stress and they don't handle it well and another person it isn't. I'm not very good with these statements that go, this is always that and this is always this. My bs meter comes up again because it changes per patient, per situation if one is honest, but then that takes more time. Going to try Mayo Clinic, they acknowledge ovaries produce hormones after menopause. Good luck. Um, and creates hormonal balance. Will replay, yes, Margaret, you can watch the Facebook Live. I had estrogen positive breast cancer. Why then tamoxifen and breast cancer? Well, tamoxifen was first, so you know, in the many years ago before tamoxifen, estrogen was used to treat breast cancer especially metastatic breast cancer. And they gave high dose. They gave six milligrams to 10 milligrams a day because I just said earlier that down regulates the receptor. So they successfully used estrogen to treat serious breast cancer before tamoxifen came in the show. Then a woman invented tamoxifen, I have hair in my face, and Craig Jordan put tamoxifen on the map for breast cancer patients. He knows that the lives of people on tamoxifen or on other breast uh, estrogen blockers like aromatase inhibitors 
really reduces the quality of life, makes you much more at risk of dementia and all the things we just talked about. So he's madly over at MD Anderson trying to come up with what they feel are positive and safe hormones for breast cancer patients to take. But um, there's a big debate about tamoxifen. Um, that's too big to get into at this moment. I was recommended tamoxifen when I had breast cancer and I turned out to have breast cancer because my mother took the most powerful estrogen endocrine disrupting chemical when she was pregnant with me, DES. It's 50 times more powerful than estradiol. So my doctor recommended tamoxifen, but no one had ever had the type of tumor I had. I had the very first case of a pure mucinous breast cancer 26 years ago in the United States. So I called up Craig Jordan and he kindly took my call. And I said, do you, I'm a DES daughter. I've got this rare type of breast cancer. Do you think I should take tamoxifen? Cause he's the guy who put it on the map. So he said, no one's ever asked me that question before. I'm gonna get back to you cause I gotta think about this. And he called me a week later to his credit. And he said, if I was you, now he's the guy who put tamoxifen on the map for breast cancer patients, very famous researcher in breast cancer. He said, if I was you, I wouldn't do tamoxifen. It looks almost exactly like the DES molecule. I'm not safe knowing what that will do for you. And it sounds like you're doing really well. I told him all the things I was doing. So now when I go to breast cancer doctors, every single time I go in, they go, you made a terrible mistake not being on tamoxifen. I go, well, I talked to Greg Jordan. They go, well, nope. Made it I'm 26 years, <clears throat> I don't mean to boast about it. I pray to maintain it, but they still tell me I'm totally wrong that I didn't do that. It's crazy. Can you explain why some women gain weight if they start hormones? I really think if you gain weight when you start hormones, <clears throat> you are not taking balanced hormones or the metabolite production from the parent compounds is being altered. We're gonna go for a few more minutes because we're at 1250. Um, so it has a lot to do with metabolism. And so I think you need to do a 24 hour urine or a Dutch test and have someone look at the metabolic pathway of those hormones. I've been on bioidenticals, but I've had an extremely high sex hormone binding globulin result that they can't work out. So I'm worried it's caused by hormones. It's the highest she's ever seen. Um, well, you can bring down sex hormone binding globulin. There, there's like 20 or 30 underlying health conditions that can elevate sex hormone binding globulin. So you have to rule those out. And you can also use high dose boron for several months to also lower it. But if you don't, if there's an underlying organic health issue that you haven't taken care of, like hypothyroidism or hidden hypothyroidism classically elevates sex hormone binding globulin. So you have to have someone that looks at the bigger picture. It's always the bigger picture. Have arthritis and knees probably need to go back on um, bioidentical hormones. There's so many things to do for arthritis, but bioidentical hormones are at the top of the list. So good luck with you with that. One intervention helps with the water weight gain. I've already talked about that. Is the science political? It's totally political. It's totally monetized. It's exasperating. Question from Facebook Live. I'm turning 50 at the end of the month. My moon cycle is still regular. Is now a good time to start any type of treatment? Well, it depends on what your, your problems are. If you have absolutely no symptoms and you're doing great and you're not menopausal yet, you probably don't need hormones. It's all over the map. My mentor, Jonathan Wright, will not give hormones to a woman who's still menstruating. I know lots of doctors who will give hormones to women who are perimenopausal and still menstruating. So it's once again, everyone's got their own opinion. But if you're doing well and you don't have issues in your tissues, then I would say don't start until you do have issues in your tissues. Are there any studies on giving women hormones post breast cancer? Many studies. Read, a, read my um, ebook where I summarize those studies. I give them all there in the, the appendix and also Avram Blooming's Estrogen Matters. But remember, he works for Wyeth. He promotes Premarin, which is made by Wyeth. So just keep that caveat in your mind. I have high sex hormone binding globulin, but I'm not on any hormones. I just had my genetics done. I'm looking into a couple of SNPs. I believe there's some herbs help me lower in addition to them. If you do boron, it's got to be a really high dose, like nine milligrams a day divided into three dosages. Question from Facebook. As a provider, how can we get on the coalition? Anybody can get on the coalition. <clears throat> I'll, um, I don't know where to put it, but uh, David Rosensweet, who happens to happen to be my doctor when I had breast cancer, and he is now and then when I wrote the sequel to Safe Hormones, which I haven't published yet, it's a long story, 
he wrote the foreword. Now he's the head of the coalition. So we have intertwined in each other's lives. And he's a lovely, amazing human being. And his son, Joshua, the two of them are putting hundreds and hundreds of hours into this. So I don't know. I guess what I'll do is in my Facebook lot group, I'll put his, if doctors want to join the coalition, it's open to anybody. I'll put his email. I'll ask him for permission. I have to ask him how to do this and then we'll get back to you. So why don't you email me at info at drlindsayberkson.com and tell me you want to be part of the coalition. And then I will connect you with David Rosensweet. David Rosensweet. He's in, he just moved two days ago to, um, Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, that's a private, that's a private. What, which labs do I use to dose? Well, I usually use 24 hour urine, but sometimes I use 24 hour urine with blood at the, on exactly the same day. So I do a variety of them. You mentioned transdermal is safer over oral. Uh, what about oral micronized project? Well, see, oral progesterone is fine. It's oral estrogen we worry about or oral testosterone. Both of those are linked to more issues if you take them orally. Oral progesterone, you make metabolites that you want to make if someone's anxious, inflamed, or can't sleep, but you might not make enough progesterone to oppose estrogen. So we now often give progesterone orally, if we give it that way, with another interventional delivery mode. These are things we'll discuss in the group. So will bioidentical biohormones be covered by insurance. I think that the FDA approved ones will, but they're oral. They don't contain estriol and not all hormones are the same. They come in different sizes. Micronization refers to the size of the hormone. So when you get a compounded hormone, if they buy really quality hormones, they're much smaller and much more bioavailable. Whereas Prometrium, for example, that's a patentable oral progesterone is much larger. Some women can absorb it and handle Prometrium great. Other women can't. So a hormone is not a hormone is not a hormone. They're different. They're different sizes, just like there's different levels of food. So it's involved. Um, sh that's private. Uh, okay. Someone's, uh, I'm 44. The last, and we're almost done. The last two years, my smooth, plump skin has rapidly deflated. Well, you know, that's what happens. Hormones keep up the plumpness of your skin. I've been on hormones for 22 years and you can see, plus I work out and I eat well, I haven't had exactly the same skin changes as someone who hasn't been on hormones all that time. <clears throat> Does anyone know of an integrative doctor in San Francisco area? You can ask the compounding therapist. You can also go to um, A4M, which is a four to five year certification program for functional docs, which I've taught at for the last 10 years or so. And they train doctors. So you can ask who are graduates, but just because they're graduates doesn't mean that they've done a deep dive yet. They might just be beginning, but they often have really good education under their belt. So there's lots of, there's IFM, A4M and PCCA, and they all do a great job of training practitioners. And so you want to get someone who's spent all that money and time because they're passionate about learning all that. And it's a huge amount on a practitioner to have finished school, be seeing patients, fly out for these weekends. These are committed, passionate people. So there are really great practitioners out there. But of course, experience and time in your career is irreplaceable, right? Because you, you know what was the trend 20, 30 years ago, and you can connect it to the article you're reading today and think about it. You just, you've been around longer, like aging gives you some wisdom because you've been through more. Uh, would you give a functional level for serum estradiol that is protective? It, it varies from patient to patient. Um, but I, you know, I'd like it to be somewhere between 65 and hundred plus something like that. I had breast cancer twice, was told it was estrogen related once. Oh, we went to this. Yeah, we, we already did that. Um, and you, who to go to ask your compounding pharmacist in Kentucky. And I think we're almost, I'm from India. What is your final say to it? What is your final say to international audience? You know, I, I lectured in Canada. There's very little functional medicine in Canada because all the medicine is paid for by the government, but yet Dennis Wong is one of the most brilliant compounding pharmacists in Canada has him as a resource. So I would say to find the people that have made it their life's career 
to be knowledgeable and intelligent in this field of medicine and look for them. And once again, I think a great portal are compounding pharmacists. I'm almost done. Lindsay, would you please give a functional love? Oh, I already did that. Do you continue to produce hormones from your ovaries? There's a little bit of a debate about that. Maybe there are other hormones too that are circadian rhythmicity hormones that aren't necessarily the sex steroid hormones. Um, what test do I use? I use Meridian uh, 24 hour. So I was, um, I did my rotation with Jonathan the year and a half before he started Meridian. And when he started Meridian, I was one of his very first clients and I've been with him since he began Meridian. So I've been using that test for so long. I, I have a comfy level with that. So docs find something that they're comfortable with that. So people often come to me and they want to bring their own labs, a Dutch test or this or that. And I'm not as comfortable with those other labs as I am with what I've been using for years. So people want to save a little bit of money and they often get a little worse care because they're making you get a little bit out of your your knowledge base. So remember that when you, you know, on both sides of the desk, I no longer have a uterus, but have my ovaries and I'm postmenopausal. Would I benefit from progesterone and estrogen without a uterus? Now, after listening to this talk, what do you think? What do you think? I think, yes. Okay. There's somebody that's, um, I think we're now we're at one o'clock. I can't get to all the questions. I've tried to do them all. Um, how, oh, one, the last question, how old is too old to start hormones? I'm 69. So in Tulsa, we had quite a number of ladies that were in their nineties that began hormones and their lives were changed. One woman, and I'll, leave, I'll end with this. Her kids brought her to us. Her kids were in Austin, but she lived in Tulsa. So, you know, I live in Austin. Plus I worked in Tulsa one week a month. And she was on 14 or 15 meds, gained a lot of weight, really bad knees, isolated, depressed. And it turned out that one of the meds she was on caused huge weight gain. So we got her off that and on an alternative, got her on hormones. Within about three months, she was down to three meds from 14 or 15 meds because hormones often reduce your need for interventional pharmaceuticals. Not always, but you have to be very strategic with doing that. And within about six to seven months, this 90 year old woman started hanging out with the pool boy and having a friendship relationship with him that changed her whole life and became non isolated, but social and really had her life given back to her. So it's never too late to be on hormones. I hope to be the most healthily hormone balanced corpse in the cemetery, although I'll probably be cremated, but nothing says I love you like balanced hormones. I hope this has been an eye opener. I hope you consider joining me on some level of my course. And if you don't, God bless you and have a wonderful life in these chaotic times. We will get over all this, but love and the true vitamin C connection supersede all politics. Thank you for this time and my ability to serve you. It means so much to me. This is a lifelong work of mine. I serve up to you. Blessings, everybody. Bye-bye. Be well. Be well, my new friends. Be well.